Every uh, Christmas, as we hear the narrative about the birth of Christ, part of the story includes some mysterious travelers who came from a distant country to investigate the birth of Christ. And they're often depicted in songs and in artwork as three kings, but if we carefully study the scriptures that actually record the evidence of these mysterious travelers, um, we find that there are some suppositions that aren't necessarily correct. So I don't want to spoil your image of Christmas and Christmas cards and nativity scenes, but I have a habit of doing this every year as we want to separate tradition from truth. And so this morning what we're going to do is we look in Matthew chapter 2. I invite you to go ahead and open your Bible apps or your printed Bibles, whatever you have, to Matthew chapter 2. And let's investigate and see what the scripture actually teaches because the account about these mysterious travelers, um, it definitely teaches us some things that we need to pay attention to and apply to our lives, but then there's a lot of things that have been supposed about these individuals that are not necessarily true. Um, Just before we get started, a couple of things, think about it. Number one, they're often thought of as kings. But you're going to see in this passage in Matthew 2, there's nowhere that it mentions that they are kings. Also, there's nowhere here in Matthew 2 that we're going to see that it mentions there were three of them. Because it does say that there was more than one. It refers to them in the plural. So where does all this stuff come from? Well, some of it is some suppositions uh, based on reading the scriptures. So let's address a few of them. And uh, then we'll get into the passage to see what it really teaches. Because what... My desire is today, as I'm trusting the Lord's Spirit to communicate what he wants us to hear, is as we separate fact from fiction and we really look at the truth, there are some valuable lessons we can learn about these travelers and some biblical principles that they were actually putting into effect, scriptural, spiritual principles that they were putting effect into their lives, even though they were not Jewish people, they were not of the culture, But God is God over us all, and they were learning to take steps that God was guiding them in. So that's the main point, but let's address a few things of what the scripture does not say. Again, doesn't say they were kings. The reason I believe that some, if you want to go ahead and put the picture up, by the way, uh, because every Christmas, when you think about these travelers from the East, what's one of the songs that comes to our mind in our culture today? We three what? We three kings. So, I mean, isn't that it? Isn't that what the scripture teaches? No, sorry. Eh. (laughs) That song was actually written in 1857, 158 years ago, by a, a minister, a rector of an institution in Pennsylvania, who was writing a song for a Christmas pageant in New York. And so he wanted to just communicate about these travelers, so he wrote the song about them being three kings. We three kings from Orient are. I don't want to chase too much of a rabbit trail, but in my mind, when I think of Orientals, I think of like people from China or places like that. But the scripture simply says they came from the east. That would be the east of Jerusalem and Israel, which would mean Babylon, current day Iran, Persia, So more than likely, these are where the travelers came from. And I'll make a little stronger case for that in a moment as we look at the scriptures and and some of the things we know about the dynamic of world history and biblical history. But again, they're they're often depicted in uh, pictures as three of them. Uh, So here is a painting that was done back in 1665. It was completed. It took the artist five years to paint. Uh, Oftentimes, we take artwork for granted in our culture today. Everything's so instantaneous and we're used to seeing people sometimes paint things right on the spot or within a a, a week or a month. But these masters of the art, sometimes they would spend years on a piece. But again, you see here depicted as uh, three people in royal robes. Why three? Well, sometimes it's on the supposition that because there were three gifts given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that perhaps one of the individuals brought gold, another frankincense, another myrrh, so three gifts, three individuals. Doesn't say that. There could have been a whole group of them, and they just all brought portions of those gifts. We don't know. There could have been a whole entourage, and more than likely probably was with these travelers who came. We do know that these travelers were wealthy. 
they would have had to have been wealthy to make a trip of that distance in that culture because of, number one, either taking a lot of food and sustenance with them for a long journey, but more than likely, along with what they took with them, they knew they would be stopping at various towns, villages, and so they would need to purchase food. They would need to purchase items, just like we do when we go on vacation and you're stopping at gas stations and you pick up a few things and you're stopping at restaurants to eat. That dynamic hasn't changed for years. They didn't have, a, obviously, we know the restaurants uh, back then, but when they would go into a village, there were inns, there were places they could go, and it cost money for all of that. So it's not unreasonable to understand that these were wealthy individuals, whoever they were, also because of the expensive gifts that they presented. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh was not the type of thing that you could give as a gift in, le- in that day unless you were very, very wealthy. And so again, the idea is, well, if they were wealthy and they traveled this long distance, chances are they were some time, type of governing officials, so perhaps they were kings. But again, the scripture does not say that. In fact, uh, in Matthew chapter 2, as we look here, um, it, it, there's just a little bit given. Uh, it, I'll just go ahead and read it, Matthew 2, 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now in the original Greek text, The word used here that's translated into English in the King James Version as wise men is literally magos, and that's why in some English translations it'll say magi or magi, however you want to pronounce it. And it's kind of where we get the idea of the the phrase magician from comes out of this. But this term magos literally does mean a person, it was a Babylonian, a an ancient Iranian term, a Persian term that was used for a person who was seeking some kind of wisdom beyond the common wisdom and knowledge of mankind. So therefore, this term was used actually for teachers, physicians, but more oftenly it was used for people who were mystics, who were clairvoyants, who were astrologers. It was a term that was used mostly for those type of individuals because they were seeking a wisdom beyond what most people are able to come across. And so they wanted to find any kind of spiritual or mystical means whereby they could attain that wisdom. And that's why it's translated into some of the versions as wise men. And that's a pretty good translation. What I want us to think about today, not to make too much of a play on words, is what was it that they exemplified with their life and their desire to have this wisdom that's above just the common wisdom that people might have? What were some of the things that they did and the steps that they took that actually led them to discover the truest form of wisdom there is? They discovered the source of all wisdom, which is the Son of God, Jesus, coming into the world. So even out of their background and their culture that was not Jewish, was not Christian, um, they looked differently than the people of Jerusalem when they arrived in town. I'm sure they created quite a stir. But the fact is, they wanted to experience God personally in their life. And they knew God was up to something. And even though they had their various beliefs about God or gods, All they knew was God was up to something here and they wanted to investigate it. And that brings us to the first thing that we can think about of why they were wise and what makes any of us truly wise is that they wanted to honor God personally. They wanted to experience God personally in their life. So again, let's take a look at what the scripture actually says. I just read it to you. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we are come, we have come to worship him. 
So we're not sure what God is doing. We're not sure what he's up to, but we're here because we want to seek that out. We want to be a part of it, and we want to personally experience this. We don't want to just be like most people who go about living in life with whatever uh, is drawing their attention or their entertainment. We want to truly experience God in our lives. So that's number one lesson that we can learn from them. Maybe you've come to church for a long time. Maybe you've gone through the motions. Maybe you've listened to different sermons or things. But God wants you to personally experience him in your life. He has more for you than ritual. He wants you to grow in your relationship and your understanding of him. That's why he sent Jesus into the world. And we see this dynamic happening. As Jesus came into the world, God is showing it's not only for people of Israel, it's for people around the world of any culture who has a desire to seek him out. Remember, Jesus himself said, seek and you will find. That's what these wise men did. Ask and it will be given you. That's what these wise men did. They came to Jerusalem and they asked and they said, where is this king we've come we want to worship him knock and the door will be opened we have to be willing to invest of ourselves a little bit what would have caused them to make this journey how in the world would they have known because they weren't of of the jewish background again this is the amazing thing when you understand world history biblical history and what it teaches which is world history it's a part of the world and it is an historical account when you study the history of Israel, we know that after God brought them out of Egypt in captivity and said, I'm going to establish you as a nation, but I want you to follow me. I want you to honor me with your life. I'm going to use you as an example to the, of the rest of the world of my grace, my mercy, my kingdom, the things that I want to set up. After God did that for a while, the people followed God, but then they began to turn from him. Generation after generation, it became a pattern. And though God was gracious and continually warned them and said, you're drifting, I want you to turn back to me. You're drifting, I want you to turn back, yet I'm going to be gracious. Eventually he said, you know what? You all aren't listening to me. I'm going, now I'm going to have to send judgment. And in that judgment, what's going to happen is enemies are going to come in because you've forsaken me, you've lived like everybody else, so I'm going to send everybody else in and they're going to carry you away captive. And you will no longer be a nation in this area, but in my plan, I'm not going to forsake you, even though I'm going to allow you to go through a time of punishment and discipline, and you're going to have to go once again into captivity, I will bring you back. Well, during that time in world history and in biblical history, as we read the Old Testament, when these things happened, guess where, we don't have to guess, we know where, the nation of Israel and the people were led captive to. They were carried off to the east, to Babylon, Assyria, and Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Now think about it. Some of these captives that were taken from Israel to these foreign cultures carried with them the word of God. Even though many of them didn't follow God, they had scriptures that they took with them. Some of the priests, some of the scribes, the teachers, they took some of those writings with them into these cultures. In fact, we know Daniel, when you read the account of Daniel, everything, the life of Daniel, it was the story of a Jewish follower of God who wanted to honor God with his life in a foreign culture while he was under captivity, and he suffered persecution for his faith, but his faith left a great impact on that culture in Babylon. Now let's fast forward. Here's some wise men from the east, from Babylon, from Persia, we don't know. But the likelihood is they, in their quest for wisdom above common knowledge, they were searching, what are the writings? What do we have from the past of some people that have come from other cultures? We want to know everything we can know about God, about life, about everything. So that's why they studied astrology. They did all this stuff. But in their study and their diligent searching, Now, this is a speculation, but it's not an out-of-the-question speculation. Perhaps they came across some of the scriptural writings that were in their culture that those that came before as captives of Israel uh, in those lands had left, such as a passage like Numbers 24, verses 17 through 19. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy the sons of Tumult. 
Now, could you see where if you were a clairvoyant or a mystic or somebody who is wanting to have a wisdom beyond the common knowledge of man and you're studying all these different writings from different cultures and you come across this, wouldn't that pique your interest? You'd say, hmm, hmm, let's go. Let, let's see what God is doing. And again, their concept of God may not at all have been what the truth was about God, but God was working through his word to point them to the truth. Now, here again is another personal application for you and I in our lives today. We claim to be followers of Jesus, and hopefully we are followers of Jesus. But how often do you diligently search the scriptures every day to say, God, show me your truth. Show me what you're doing in the world. I don't want to listen to just what everybody else thinks about you or says about you. I don't even really want to hear what Pastor Mark has to say about you. I'd like to know for myself. So I'm going to dig into the scriptures and I'm going to see what you have to say because I want to experience you personally in my life. I'm encouraging you. Spend time as much as you can on your own in the word of God. Dig into it. Read it. Pray. Because Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. If you ask, it'll be given. If you knock, it will be open to you. He didn't say that somebody's going to just come along and spoon feed you and pass it out. You've got to invest a little bit of yourself. And this is what the wise men did. Edom shall be a possession. Seir also and his enemies shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob, one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. That's in Numbers 24 if you want to look that up. By the way, that prophecy came from a, a guy, a prophet named Baal. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, not Baal, Baalum. And Balaam was a true prophet of God, but he let greed corrupt him. And so here again is an illustration that no matter who you are, God can use anybody to speak his truth, but it's not a guarantee that you're going to stay on the right path. Here's a prophecy, though, from a prophet that did stay on the right path, and perhaps they read this in Isaiah 49 from the prophet Isaiah. Indeed, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. What if the magos, those seeking wisdom, read this scripture and they're like, wow. This is, God is doing something through Israel, but it's going to be a blessing to us in other cultures. And then again, through whatever means they were using, looking for a sign, and I do believe God's spirit was directing them to some things, even supernaturally beyond these writings, because we're going to see at the conclusion of this how God used the act of what these wise men did to accomplish part of his purposes in the world that we're still being blessed by today. But I believe God's spirit was moving them through all these different things. And even in some of their maybe misconceptions about God, he was steering them into the truth. And that brings us to the second thing that the wise men did that is a great example for us today. They exercised faith in their current understanding of where they were. And they were willing to leave what was comfortable and familiar to them and go on a difficult journey to experience God personally. Some of us grow up in the church and maybe you've come to a comfortable place and you feel like I just like everything to stay right where it is right now because I'm in a good place. And that's good, but God doesn't necessarily want you to stay there. If you really want to experience God in new and fresh ways, you've got to be willing to let go of the familiar. Maybe God's challenging you, though you've served in a certain area in the church for a long time, maybe he's challenging you to leave that familiar place of service and do a new thing in the life of the church. Maybe it's something in, in your work or your personal life, but God continually wants to challenge us to do what these wise men did, and that was to exercise faith and forsake their comfort in order to truly worship Christ. So again, no matter what your life situation is, your social status, your ethnicity, your circumstances, faith is the way that God wants us to operate, and we see it in these unfamiliar, mysterious people outside of Israel. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God or do his work. You say, Mark, where do, I, where do you get that from? From the written word, the scriptures, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, which is what the wise men did, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him, which is what the wise men did. They were wise because they were willing to invest effort to seek, and they exercised faith to make this journey and to say, I want to find out what you are doing in the world, God. Faith is also required to do God's work in the world through Christ's Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, I quote this often because it is the gospel message. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, not of the things we do, not our good effort, that's not what saves us. It is a gift of God's grace, and we receive that gift through faith, through belief. Faith is putting what you believe in action. It's acting on what you believe. You can believe something and not exercise faith. That's why the Bible says that even the demons believe in God, but then they shudder and they don't do anything about it because they're opposed to God. So believing is not enough. You have to exercise faith. And faith is putting your belief into action. That's the difference between belief and faith. And again, God says the way we have to operate our life is by faith. You have to have faith to be saved, to trust in Jesus as your Savior, to, to believe that he died on the cross for your sins personally, that he rose again, and that he offers you forgiveness and grace and salvation. And then by faith, you need to begin to act on that, which means you're going to humble yourself before God, you're going to submit your life to God, and you're going to start growing in your relationship and your service for God. That's not working your way to heaven. That's responding to the gift of grace. That's taking the gift and by faith receiving it, unwrapping it, and then putting that gift into use. And then it goes on and says in Ephesians 2 8, by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then it says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's by faith that we're saved, and then it's by faith only that we can do good works in the world for Christ to honor him. So the wise men exercised faith. The third thing is they sought help in their search. Let's look at what the scripture says. Again, we find a lot there in those first two verses. Um, when they arrived there in Jerusalem, they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? So these wise men didn't have it all laid out for them. God didn't just guide them each step of the way and show them exactly what they were supposed to do. They went with the written word. They went with some signs that they believed that God was giving them to take these first steps of faith. And then they came to a place when they knew they had to go to Israel. And so probably they used just the common knowledge to say, well, if we're going to Israel, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem, so let's go to Jerusalem. Surely we can find some help there to steer us the rest of the way to find where this king is that has been born, and that's what they did. So they went to Jerusalem, and they said, hey, we're needing some help here. We want to worship this king of the Jews. Where is he? Now, here's the sad commentary. The people in Jerusalem weren't even paying attention. So here again, what's the application for us as a church? Where is it today that people ought to be able to come to, to find help, to find Jesus? <laughs> it ought to be the church. They ought to be able to come to the church and seek some help and say, where is he that's born king of the Jews? What, what is the meaning of life? I'm struggling here. I need some help. I believe there's a God, but I want to experience him in my life. They ought to be able to come to the church, the body of Christ, the capital of the kingdom, so to speak, and we ought to be able to give them some answers. And we ought to be able to give them some answers based on what has been written and then what we are observing and experiencing and living out. Some churches are, I'm not being critical, I'm just speaking the truth. Some churches can become so focused on the traditions of men and their rituals of worship that they're missing what God is doing in the world all around them and what God wants to do in and through them. We see this happen in this account because here's wise men from another culture coming and saying, hey, God's doing something awesome. We want to know what's going on. And the people in Jerusalem are scratching their heads and going, what? What? So what do they do? They go to the scriptures and it says here in verses three through eight, let's look at it now. When Herod the king heard these things, and we wouldn't expect Herod to keep up with this because he uh, was a Roman governor and so 
again, we wouldn't expect it from him, but you would think that others would. God used this to kind of wake up the people in Jerusalem. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod had the ability to assemble a team And so this is what he did in verse four. And Herod went and he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that he shall rule my people Israel. This was a prophecy from Micah and they got it from that particular scriptural passage. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem. So the wise men did what they could following God on their own, but when they got to a point where they needed some help and some guidance, they went to the one place where they thought they would get help and guidance, Jerusalem, and and thankfully they looked into the scriptures and they were able to guide the wise men on the next step go to Bethlehem. So again, in the church, we ought to be ready to take in anyone from any background, from any culture. They may not dress like us. They may not look like us. They, we may not approve of what they're currently doing in their lifestyle or whatever, but the fact is they're coming here to find some answers and to seek God. Amen? And we ought to, rather than reject them and say, well, you don't fit here. You don't look like us. You don't dress like us. Whatever. I don't like the way you look. (laughs) I don't like the things you do. Instead of being that way and sending them off, we ought to welcome them in and say, let's look into the scriptures together and, and here's what God is doing. And here's what God offers through Christ. And here's what we're experiencing. And we're not perfect people, but we also want to experience God in our life and we're trying to apply his principles to our life. This is what the church is for. And if we are going to be wise, we also need to be aware that We not not only need to help people who are coming in and asking for help, but you and I as believers in the church have to lay down our pride at times and the fronts that we put on to make it look like, I'm doing just fine and everything's great. We need to be like these wise men and we need when we're hurting or we're struggling or we're having doubts and we need some help, we need to be willing to let down our guard and open up and ask for some help. That's why these wise men were wise because they sought help and they went to the place where they could find it. He sent them to Bethlehem, said, go search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. We know as we read the rest of the passage that Herod had no intent to worship Jesus. When he heard that a prophecy was given and that this was going to be a king who would rule over Israel, he didn't want any competition. And so we find a little bit later on in the passage that when Herod realized that the wise men didn't come back to him like he asked, he got really upset and he had all the infants from two years old and younger put to death in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Now here's the other point just to separate tradition from truth, not to spoil your romantic images of the nativity. But we do not know how old Jesus was when these wise men came and visited. Most likely, in in fact, we do know that he wasn't still in a manger because he was laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. The Bible doesn't mention anything about a stable. It's just because he was laid in a feeding trough for animals, the likelihood was he was probably in some type of a situation like that. But when it talks about, and we will see in a moment when we look at the scriptures, when the wise men came to see Jesus at that time, it says he was in a house. So apparently Mary and Joseph, in their stay during that time, found relatives, family members, somebody who was compassionate that took them into their residence. And that's where the wise men actually came. I know I'm really spoiling some of your wonderful nativity images. But again, we got to separate truth from tradition. So, so I will just address this real quick. So the point is, well then Mark, if that's true, why do they have so many pictures about this and, and how did we get to where we're at? Well, here again, if you understand what artists want to do, they want to tell a story in a brief image. So what are you going to do? You're going to take all of the wonderful elements, the true elements 
of the Christmas account and the historical account, and you want to try to put it all in one image where people can look at it and then the story is told. So that's why I believe we often see the wise men at the manger. It's not that they were literally there, but it's, it's a way of communicating this is all part of this amazing thing that God is doing in the world. Does that make sense? So maybe that'll help you a little bit. Every year when we put the nativity scenes up, uh, we've kind of caved a little bit in the last couple of years because of space. But I used to always tell Julie, put the wise men over here on the mantle and put the manger over here on the table because the wise men are still on their journey. <laughs> they haven't got there yet. <laughs> but like I said, we did that for a few years. Now they're right there with the baby, you know. <laughs> but we get the idea. Again, it's trying to communicate a story. This is what artists do. It's what we do in music. So just be careful. Again, this is a challenge to all of us to along with the traditions we have, study the scriptures so that you can show yourself approved. I wanna just let you know some good news, uh, some things I rejoice in. When people come here to Porterfield, we're not able to help everybody. We do as best we can. We are limited, God is unlimited. But I am so thankful for every one of you that give of your time, your energy, your finances. Because of the way that you give, we're able to give a lot of help to people, to children, to teenagers, to young married couples, to older married couples, to those in every circumstance of life, widows and widowers and single people at a young age as best we can. And this past year, because of the way that you all have given and served, we were able to baptize 21 people so far this year once again. Every year, I praise God, we're seeing people come to Christ. They come here, they seek help. People of all ages, they get the answers they're looking for. And then we're able to celebrate that, not only through the waters of baptism, but then also encourage them to mature in their faith and grow and to serve. And that's gonna continue on into 2016, Lord willing. I wanna take a moment right now to just encourage you tonight at seven o'clock is a really important business meeting. It's our annual business meeting. And we're gonna be talking about some of our vision for the future and some of the plans that we believe God is putting before us to do and to accomplish for his glory. And also to vote on the budget for 2016. And we need you here. We want you to be informed and we want you to be able to lend your input to us. So I encourage you tonight uh, to be here at seven o'clock. And also, if you're new to Porterfield, if you've just been coming for a few weeks, a few months, or really even in the last year, at six o'clock, right before that business meeting, Pastor Eric uh, is putting together a welcome class. It's, it's just a one-time thing tonight at six o'clock, and we're gonna have some of the staff introduce themselves to you, talk a little bit about the ministries of the church. So I would encourage you to come here tonight at six if you're newer to the church and you wanna just learn a little bit more. No obligation, it's just a way we're saying, hey, we want to be available to answer questions and to give you some direction. The fourth thing that the wise men did that showed that they were wise is they continually responded to God's leading. They didn't just go for a while and then stop they were continually open to God's leading. Look at verse nine. When they heard the king, after Herod had directed them to go to Bethlehem, they departed. And behold, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. So even the journey may have started with some kind of uh, a mystical sign that they got that really was from God, whether it was from them using astrology and their charts and all of that stuff, a significant event that they saw was going to happen, whatever alignment that God used and they used, even with its imperfections, God was steering them. But we see now, apparently there must have been a time when they didn't see the star anymore and that's why they asked for help. After they got the help and they started toward Bethlehem, now God again puts the star before them. So this, we see according to the scriptures, this was not just some astrological event because of the formation of the stars up there in the heavens. That might have been part of this whole thing, but this was a miracle of God. This was a supernatural sign that God was giving to them. Perhaps it was what is referred to as the Shekinah glory of God. The same Shekinah bright light glory that God used to reveal himself to the nation of Israel when they built a tabernacle and he dwelt right over the tabernacle with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The people could visually see God's presence in the form of this light. And perhaps it was that Shekinah glory that was right over 
the place where Jesus was, because obviously God was doing something special. God was dwelling with men, which is what he told the nation of Israel he would do when they would worship him through the tabernacle, that his presence would dwell there and he would be with them. Now we're seeing God fulfill this literally through the person of his son Christ. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. We also see a couple of verses on down in verse 12 that now these wise men, after, I'm saving the obvious one for the last point, but after they had seen Christ, it says in verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. So these wise men were continually being sensitive to God's leading. That's a lesson for you and I today in the church. We need to not come to a place where we just coast, we get comfortable, but we need to continually stay sensitive and say, God, what do you want me to do? And what do you want me not to do? Give me some warnings. Help me to know what to avoid and what you want me to do for you. And this is what these wise men did. Imagine when they went back to their culture and then they shared what they experienced and saw. This is God spreading his witness in the world. I'm telling you, church, God works in ways that we're totally unaware of. Yes, he absolutely works through the church, he works through us, but God communicates in various means around the world. And he is doing that now in Muslim cultures. He's doing that with people who perhaps are like these wise men. They want to honor God and they think they're worshiping God, but it's not the true God. And they're not worshiping him in the right way. But because they are serious about their relationship with God, God is going to guide them into the truth to know the truth of Christ. And this is what the church needs to do as we're having those of a foreign culture come into America. I know people get upset about it. I understand all that politically. We're not even going to get into that. But let's not miss the opportunity that God is giving us as a nation to be missionaries right here on our own shore. God is saying, you know what? You've gone out into the whole world to be a witness. Well, now I'm bringing the world to you. You better be a light where you're at. This is what God was doing in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. He was bringing the world to that area and they needed to be a witness. And then they were going back to their homeland and talking about what they had experienced. God works in ways beyond our understanding. So let's not pigeonhole God or uh, presume things of God. Let's let God be God, but let's be faithful in what he's called us to do. That brings us to the fifth and the final thing that I feel led to share with you today. And this is the most obvious thing. They showed that they were wise because they gave tangible gifts of worship to Christ. That's not a misprint. Worship literally is worthship. In other words, what you worship and the way you worship shows how much you really value it. So we can say we worship Jesus, but if all we do is occasionally give him a few minutes of our time and our attention, and we throw a little tip in every Sunday now and then, okay, that's worship, but you're really showing how much worth-ship he has in your life. True worship is worship. These people, though they didn't even know God, they were bringing their best. They brought gold. They bought frankincense. They bought, brought myrrh. They brought of their ability and they offered it to Christ. The song that we sang about the little drummer boy, like I say, that's not a biblical account. I think we all get that. But it did teach a principle there that this little boy in this made-up story teaches us a biblical principle that it's not how much you give or how much you have. It's the way you give, the heart you give, and giving of the best that you have, not your leftovers. And that's what that song said. The little drummer boy, he's like, I don't have, a, I don't have any money to give you, but I got some talents, and I'm going to play, and I'm going to play my best for you. And again, that's, that's, that's not a true account, but it's a biblical principle. When you have a heart that wants to honor God and give the best of what you have, not your leftovers, the best of what you have, it honors God and he uses it greatly and he will bless you. And really God, God owns it all anyway. He just simply gives you the opportunity by faith to be wise and with a willing, humble heart out of appreciation and gratitude for all that Christ has done for you 
You're saying, I'm going to give back into the work of your kingdom, God. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Notice it says young child, and notice it said house. <laughs> When they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. So we don't know if Jesus at this point was six months old, a year old, but we definitely know he was at least under the age of two, according to what we read in the rest of the scriptures at, that, at this account. But anyway, they fell down and they worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, there it is, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Notice it says they presented to him. So again, I think he may have been a year old, and even at a year old, I mean, we've all seen one-year-olds. Imagine if you opened some kind of box or bag and there's all this shiny gold. I mean, at one year, could you imagine the eyes light up? Like, ooh, that's pretty, that's shiny. And they opened perhaps the frankincense and it's an incense and it smelled wonderful. And so, again, he was enjoying this. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss. We don't often think about how God used those gifts for Jesus to actually accomplish something that all of us are benefiting from still today. We know from the scriptures that Mary and Joseph were very poor, humble people. He was a carpenter, he was a hard worker, but he didn't make a lot of money. The journey that they had was difficult. I mean, they weren't even, they didn't even have enough money to buy off the innkeeper to say, kick somebody else out and we'll take a room. They had to stay wherever animals were kept and they put this child in a feeding trough for animals, so they were poor. And because of what Herod did, as we read in the scriptures, he wanted to have all the infants of two years old and under killed in Jerusalem. So God warned Joseph in a dream saying, you're gonna to have to take this child, you're gonna to have to flee to Egypt. Imagine if the wise men hadn't brought those gifts, how would they have made the journey to Egypt? What would they have lived on while they were in Egypt? Now, I get it, God provides, he would have provided a way, we know that. But that's not the lesson we're learning here. I believe that God moved these wise men and he used the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, not to be worshiped, not to be set up in a place somewhere and bow down to the treasures and the gifts. Those valuable things were used to fund Mary and Joseph being able to make the journey. I believe that Joseph was so grateful and he recognized what God had done through the giving of these generous people that as they sold him and as they used the resources, he had everything he needed. He was being taught how to be a good steward with what you're given. And he used it to help take care of Jesus. And God was using all of these things, both the supernatural and the natural, to accomplish his will in the world and in our lives. You and I today are still benefiting from the gifts those wise men gave to Mary and Joseph years ago. I believe that. So what's the lesson for us today? When you give into the work of Christ's kingdom, when you give your best, when you put your money in the offering plate, we want to use that wisely. We want to use it for the work of Christ's kingdom. We want to use it to do his work in the world, to preserve him, to bless him, to honor him, so that his work will continue not only for us, but for generations to come. And so that's why tonight, a business meeting <laughs> is important and a budget is important and your giving is important. So thank you. Thank you for the way that you give and the way that you serve. But let's continue to follow God's leading. Let's not coast. Let's stay sensitive. What are the five things just in review? How can we be wise like these individuals were? Well, be willing to honor Christ personally with your life. Exercise enough faith to leave your comfort zone and to seek God's will. And ask for help in this search. That's what we're here for. We need to help one another. We're not always going to know the answer. There's times we're going to get discouraged. There's times we're going to get confused. I don't want to scare you, but there's times as your pastor, I need help. <laughs> I get a little scared. I get a little confused. God's placed people in my life and mentors and, and other pastors and people in this very congregation that encourage me and help me. It's what we're here for. We're to help one another. Seek help in your search. Be continually alert and responsive to God's leading in the various ways in your life. And certainly give tangibly into the work of Christ's kingdom. And it can start today. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ truly, I believe God is speaking to you this morning to say that's where it all begins. Just give me your soul, give me your spirit, give me your heart, give me your life and see what I can do with it and experience me personally in your life. Would you stand and pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to share your word. Thank you for the richness of it. Thank you for the things that we can learn. Thank you that you can help us separate truth from tradition. And it's all because of your written word that you have uh, protected from generation to generation. And we still have it today because of the work of your spirit. Thank you for that. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that is alive. Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive, that you're right now in heaven bodily at the right hand of the Father. We can't fully comprehend it, Lord, in, in our minds. But I thank you that this is all part of your plan. And you said, Jesus, that once you came into this world and took on flesh and blood and died on the cross for us as the one perfect mediator, interceder, the perfect one, fully God, fully man, you're the one who is in a position that you can mediate between sinful people and a holy and righteous God. So Jesus, thank you for the work you've done for us. Thank you that we celebrate that this time of year and really every day, the fact that you came into the world and lived life as we do, yet without sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for every single one of our sins here, every single person. And Lord, if there's one here today who hasn't yet put their trust in you. I pray in this moment right now, you'll take the seed of faith that's been planted into their heart that you put there, help them to exercise it and to put their belief into action through faith, trusting Christ as Savior. Help them in these moments to just pray, Lord, I know I've messed up and uh, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I admit that to you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And you died on the cross to bring me out of my lost condition that I might come to know you. I believe Jesus died for me personally. I believe you, Jesus, that you rose again. And I believe you, Jesus, that you love me and you want to be in my life. So I open my life to you now. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, to come into my soul, my spirit, my life. I yield myself to you. I surrender myself to you. I give myself to you because right now I feel like that's all I got to offer. And Lord, fill me with your presence and help me live for you. Lord, help us in these moments to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. For those of us who have trusted you, help us on this journey. Help us to ask help of one another. Lord, I pray for our children, our grandchildren in this culture that we live in. There are so many things that pull us away from you. Forgive us, help us. I pray that you will draw our children and our grandchildren back to you. Help us, Lord, to make the necessary changes in our life that we can be that example and we can be used of you. So I pray for your church around the world. But right now, Father, I'm praying for your church here at Porterfield that you would just please help us to follow these examples that we see not only through the wise men, but through the prophets and through all that you've taught us down through history from past time to present of what you want us to do in our worship of you and our growth in our relationship with you. So help us now in these moments to follow your leading and we give you the praise in Christ's name.